inside the Palazzo della Pilotta in Parma, this huge building that was uh, started in the second half of the 16th century, but renewed, changed uh, so many times till the beginning of the 19th century. So, like in the case of this gallery, we can found a whole a structure belonging to the neoclassical period with columns, arches, and niches, and so on. Uh, built, uh, realized, uh, around the gust of, uh, um, of, of this uh, uh, neoclassical or imperial, uh, as you like, uh, period. Um, in this uh, um, gallery is collected a part of uh, um, the famous uh, painting collection of uh, the National Gallery of Parma, that is very rich of canvases uh, from different periods, but here in particular there is a fascinating collection of portraits um, for the major part related to the Bourbon family. Bourbon of Spain, because the last Farnese, the last member of the Farnese ducal family was a lady, Elizabeth, and she married Philip III, the first Bourbon king of Spain, the same dynasty of Juan Carlos or Felipe today. Eh? And, uh, and so Parma uh, was inherited by one of the sons um, of Elizabeth and uh, became a dominion of a uh, um, uh, secondary branch of the Spanish royal family. Well, and always in this uh, nice, elegant gallery, there is a real great masterpiece, that is the statue, that you can see, made of marble of Carrara by Antonio Canova. Surely the most important sculpture of the neoclassical period in Europe. He worked for the popes, he worked for Napoleon, uh, the czars of Russia adore to collect his creation and so on. And this is particular because uh, um, the statue represents Maria Luisa of Austria, so from Habsburg, like a Roman Empress or maybe like um, the god Juno, the goddess, sorry, Juno, uh, the queen of the gods, uh, the Greek and Roman mythology. Um, uh, the, the statue was uh, um, realized after the, the collapse of the Napoleon Empire and uh, is situated in Parma, and in particular in this museum, since uh, um, that period, as a matter of fact. you can admire the most astonishing uh, structure of the um, Palazzo della Pilota in Parma. Um, I mean the famous Teatro Farnese, that was the court theater of the ducal family, uh, Farnese of course. And the theater was created uh, about in 1618, uh, sorry, 
and um, was designed by an architect, uh, an artist called Argenta. Pay attention because Argenta, that was quite famous uh, during this period, was not the traditional architect who designs uh, churches, uh, towers, uh, palaces, no, no, no. He was specialized in, uh, we can say, the ephemerals, so in beautiful things but destined to be destroyed after a brief period. So scenery, triampalaches, uh, statues and so on, created in very cheap material just for, I don't know, a tournament or a big um, ceremony organized outside the palace or uh, for the entering, the arrival um, of important uh, state guests like um, the emperor or the pope, for example. So the idea entering was uh, the, um, of an ancient theatre like in Greece or Rome made of pure, pure marble. Eh? And another thing fantastic was the ceiling no longer existing that was made with a huge fabric of cotton or, or silk maybe painted to give him the idea of the free sky with clouds, with cherubs and so on, like uh, into a Greek a classical theatre. And um, ah, another thing, the, the theatre was decorated with a lot of statues, um, uh, the major part of them disappeared, of course, during the bombing. But we have, for example, the new that uh, um, the lower balustrade was decorated with statues of Putos holding torches for uh, giving the correct illumination during, during the, the show. And uh, ah, another and the last fantastic uh, thing uh, is that the theatre could be filled by water in such a way the Farnese could organise inside the theatre the famous ship battle of the ancient Romans. <laughs> Things are really unbelievable but true. Well, uh, now we are in the beautiful Palatine Bibliothek of uh, um, Palazzo della Pilota, where uh, is organized a part of the great large exhibition that the town has dedicated this year to the Ducal family. And this part of the bibliothek is uh, the most charming because uh, um, it was organized for uh, giving to the public the idea of the type of collectionism uh, of between the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, in, not only in Parma but generally in Europe. Um, uh, the collection of royal families were composed by um, canvases, of course, and here in the Palatine Bibliothek we have a magnificent portrait of Pope um, Paul III made by Titian, by Tiziano in Italian. Uh, Paul III was uh, really the founder of the glories of his family uh, because till Paul III, the Farnese were, yes, noble, uh, a noble family, but um, of a small nobility, not very important, uh, of the era of Viterbo, not far from Rome. Um, when um, uh, Paul III became a cardinal with the name of Alessandro Farnese, the destiny of the family changed completely because uh, Alessandro was a very clever, also astute gentleman with a beautiful, beautiful sister, Giulia Farnese, considered one of the most fascinating ladies of the century. 
and he was so able to introduce the sister in the bed of the Pope reigning in this period, the terrible Alexander Borgia, the father of Lucrezia Borgia. And uh, of course, the old Pope, the, the old Alexander, lost his head completely with the beauty of Julia, and so he started to give honor, money, richness, and so on to the family. And in a brief time, the Farnese family became one of the most important of Rome. Uh, after some years, the same Alessandro uh, was created Pope during the Council, and in such a way, he was able to um, uh, complete in a definitely way the glory of the family and also the history of Parma because ba Parma was originally an independent commune, a free commune, but belonging to the states of the church. And uh, Alessandro decided to create a duchy, the duchy of Parma e Facenza, for his first born son, Pierluigi Farnese. Yes, son of the Pope, most normal during the period. And in such a way started the domination of the family in on this area of northern Italy. So, in, in this box, uh, in this uh, cupboard, we have a really sumptuous object, uh, en français, a coffre. Um, uh, a casket um, that is made of gilded silver, uh, precious stones, uh, and uh, well, these are fantastic. They are not uh, pieces over glasses, but is rock crystal um, worked in exceptional way in Milan because during the period, the most important factory for the semi-precious stones were in Milan. And this uh, rich object is, in a very simple way, a box. A box for containing the real masterpiece that is uh, the, fa the famous Tazza Farnese, in English, uh, Farnese Cup. As a matter of fact, it's not a cup, it's a patera or fiale, it was uh, a vase used during the sacrifices in in the pagan the sacrifice, sorry, in the pagan religion, As, um, but currently the name was was Coppa was cut, and is uh, uh, in Calcedonio, so um, semi precious stones with different layers of different colors. Uh, that are used, that were, but also today used by the creator of cameos for obtaining the different chromatic solution of the composition. Uh, this is beautiful for two fundamental mo motives. The um, artistic value that is terribly high, the execution of the figures in the middle that represent the glory of the empire, the richness of the empire, are made in a fantastic way with fantastic details. But the other important thing is uh, are the dimensions, because this is the largest cameo existing in the world. And more is a Roman cameo, so you can imagine the value of this beautiful piece of art. Well, mm, we have seen the uh, portrait by Titian representing the Pope Paul III, Farnese, the founder of the glory of the family, but the most famous member of the dynasty is not the Pope, but uh, Alessandro Farnese, his uh, nephew, that you can see here in a particular original but very nice paintings uh, in which the young Duke of Parma um, is uh, meeting and speaking in a very confidential way with a goddess. Uh, it, she's not properly a goddess, it's uh, the mythological representation of the town of Parma. 
and it's very easy to understand it because near the goddess uh, there is a shield with a noble shape and uh, in Latin this variety of shields of the Roman army were called Parma. Uh, probably, we think we are not sure, um, uh, the name of this city derives from the original shape of the town that was oval like a Parma of uh, uh, the Roman soldiers. Uh, but coming back to Alessandro, Alessandro was uh, an unbelievable man, very cultivated, a very handsome man. He married uh, the um, daughter of uh, uh, the king of Portugal, so a royal marriage. Uh, he was full of uh, cultural and literary interesting, uh, interest, uh, sorry, and more, this is important, was a fantastic politician and a mythological man of war. As a matter of fact, the king of Spain, uh, Philip II, every time had problems uh, in war, for example, with uh, the um, Belgian provinces uh, that were under the Spanish domination, but they um, didn't like this, uh, so there were a revolution every two days. Regularly, the king, Philip II, sent uh, the Duke of Parma to control, to solve the situation. So, really a, a great personage. And now, <laughs> I think that I adore, well, there is not the value of the Tazza Farnese that is without price. That uh, is fantastic and was uh, mm, an object that was uh, mm, almost common during the late 16th century. You can see uh, is a silver statuette representing a deer mounted by the goddess of the hunting, Diana. But in the reality is a, a play for adults, of course, used during the banquet. Well, it's very easy to see that there is an hole for a key, eh? because in the reality, a sort of robot, hmm? uh, when you have uh, um, used the key, you can put the statue on the table, and the statue moves with a very strange uh, movement and so on. Move, moves for a few minutes. Uh, the use was that the gentleman or the lady facing which the statue um, wo uh, was still was created the king of the queen of the banquet and the head of the deer, you can open it and in the reality is a little glass, the body is full of wine and so on, and the new uh, king of the new queen was served with this symbol of the new situation for me. It's fantastic. If you want a little bit stupid, but sometimes the stupid things are the most uh, amazing. Uh, so uh, this was the original destination of uh, the Statue of Diana. We are in, in Parma, uh, that is another very, very interesting town, but uh, unluckily uh, not appreciated uh, as uh, it merits because uh, also for Italian people, not only for the foreigners, uh, Parma is uh, prosciutto, means prosciutto, yes, ham in English. This is okay because the Parma ham is one of the most uh, uh, fantastic Italian food that you can find, but uh, the city Parma is far, far more than ham. Eh? Also, Parma was a capital of an independent state, or is more, because before the reunification of Italy, uh, the Dukes of Parma were not the Gonzaga, like in Mantua, but the Farnese family, another important 
dynasty uh, of our history and grace to the presence of the court, of the Farnesian court. Um, the, the town was uh, um, decorated with uh, elegant palaces, beautiful churches and so on. Eh? For example, behind me you can see one of the many facades of a particular building that was uh, um, a part of the uh, ducal residence of Farnese and is called uh, Palazzo della Pilotta. Uh, well, Pilotta is a very bizarre name also for the Italian people because you can find it only in Parma and is uh, the transformation of uh, a um, Spanish word, Pelota, that means bow. As a matter of fact, the game of Pelota is one of the ancestors of the actual game of tennis. Different, of course, for many, many things, but the idea is the same, is to launch a ball uh, by means of uh, something like uh, also, also the end, uh, very simply, but uh, as a matter of fact, it's called uh, in, in Francais uh, Jeu de Pomme. Fine, um, now uh, um, we can have a, a visit of the historical medieval uh, center of Parma uh, that is articulated around uh, two uh, famous squares. The first one is uh, um, Piazza Duomo, that means uh, Cathedral Square, because it's dominated by the Cathedral of Parma, a very ancient building, and there are also the um, Palace of the Bishop, Romanesque age, so about uh, 12th century. But the most important building is the Baptistry of Parma. This is the masterpiece of a great architect and sculpture uh, between the Roman and the Gothic period, uh, whose name is Benedetto Antelami. Well, um, the inside of the cathedral, as a matter of fact, is the original Romanesque one with uh, the so-called Matroneum, that is the upper gallery, reserved originally to the lady, because during the past the ladies and men cannot follow the, the mass of the service altogether. But today it's quite impossible to understand immediately that uh, is the original medieval church because it was uh, covered by a series of very rich frescoes, uh, um, both uh, in the ceiling and uh, in, during the walls of the nave. And uh, among these frescoes, uh, the most important one is uh, uh, the cycle that we can see in the cupola of the church is the assumption of Virgin Mary to the heaven after her death and is considered the absolute masterpiece of Parmigian, pardon, of Correggio, sorry, but the two were related and so sometimes, no, no, the name is Correggio, um, that uh, was the, the most important uh, exponent, member, of the Parmesan school of painting. He lives between, uh, during the, um, the first part of the 16th century. So, um, now we can admire 
one of the four doors of the baptistry of Parma, an absolute masterpiece of uh, sculpture and architecture between the end of the Romanesque and the beginning of the Gothic period. I told or I already told that the name of the master was Benedetto Antelami and uh, the baptistries is octagonal but not for a question of taste or fashion, no, it's a, a symbol, a Christian symbol, early Christian symbol because uh, um, the number seven was uh, a representation of the, a complete cycle ended and complete. With the number eight, there is, we have the beginning of a new cycle of seven. And this is very important for the Christian baptism because we know that with the water, the holy water, the new Christian is death to uh, the scene, so seven and its cycle and is a, a beginning a new cycle, number eight, in the grace of Christ. Eh? Uh, so in particular this, uh, um, this door is uh, really fantastic because you can see the Pantocrator, that is uh, the Jesus Christ omnipotence in Latin, surrounded by angels, by prophets, by uh, martyrs and so on. An important thing discovered by my sister, my sister is uh, uh, specialized in the restoration of these old things. Originally the sculptures, the reliefs were painted with very, very lavish, lively colors, red, blue, green, gold, a lot of pure gold. But, uh, alas, the major part of this uh, uh, painted and gilded decoration disappear because of uh, uh, weather, rain, sun and so on. It's a pity, but originally it was in this condition. Mr. Riccardo, you are one of the greatest art historians in Italy. So, when did you really fall in love with art? Well, <laughs> thank you for all the great art historian, it's really kind of you. Uh, well, when? Uh, when I was uh, really a, a baby, because I, I, I remember that uh, I was uh, about five years old, and for the first time, my parents asked me about the present of birthday because normally um, was, it was chosen without uh, asking me my desires. My for first time, uh, uh, five years old, I asked the complete collection of Mozart concerts. Uh, and uh, five years, which is not a normal a normal uh, thing for a five-year-old child and uh, and then how was your and then well apart from uh, classical music that is also today a great passion for me particular operas and I act also like director for operas like Rigoletto, Traviata and so on um, immediately after there was a new passion that uh, was history but not the contemporary or 19th century, for me is a little boring, but uh, the ancient history, so Egyptian, Greek, Romans, and then uh, medieval period, Renaissance period, Baroque period, and I was fascinated in particular by the great figures, personages of, uh, of the history, like, um, I don't know, um, Cleopatra, or Nerone, Nero in, uh, in English, and then um, the Emperor Frederick II of Sweden, uh, Peter the Great of Russia, 
And so also um, with, with, this, with the help of this um, interest for the personages, the most important personages, also history became uh, one of my passion. You traveled a lot and you start traveling at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Yes, long. yes. Um, well, I was really young, uh, young sorry. Mm, naturally, I traveled not like a tourist, but uh, for the languages. So I spent uh, one month, two months during summer in Great Britain or United States or France. Um, uh, and for me, it was a very important uh, experience. Uh, and. Uh, really beautiful for me because uh, as a young boy I had the occasion of meet um, of meeting people of completely different uh, civilization uh, languages uh, uh, culture a very stimulating uh, experience for my brain you made the experience of college but you didn't like it no <laughs> the college for me was uh, really a disaster uh, for two reasons. Uh, I am not uh, a man uh, for colleges. Uh, for me they are oppressing, sad, dark. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I like to be free. And the second thing is that uh, um, uh, college, for example, in England, were crowded by Italians, so you had not occasion, apart from the hours of the lessons, to speak uh, English with uh, for the normal mm, things of their life, and that is very important. So after two e terrible experiences in, uh, in colleges, uh, uh, I changed completely my destination and uh, I spent uh, this cultural period only living with local family. Mr. Ricardo, you have an impressive life. So, what is one of the most important things for you today? But, well, of course, my family, my sister in particular, animals, <laughs> because I adore pets and in particular cats. But, yes, there is a, a thing about, I am really proud is uh, an activity of uh, volunteering, uh, or volunteering, better correct pronunciation, for example, in prisons. Uh, each uh, week uh, or uh, um, each of 15 days, uh, I go to the Mantua's prisons for teaching history of art uh, of uh, people living in this situation and also the criminal asylum there is a criminal asylum very very important in the province of Mantua with people that uh, did uh, terrible things uh, but uh, is not their fault the, is uh, the mental illness uh, that uh, uh, acted for uh, for for them and uh, also in this case uh, I organize uh, it depends from the years, courses of art or courses of classical music, uh, also courses of um, cooking, for example. For, and uh, is is really a fantastic experience. In particular, the criminal, uh, the, the, in the guests of the criminal asylum, uh, uh, they have a, a, a love for me that uh, is fantastic. Uh, for me, these are the really important things uh, in their life uh, to be able to understand the others also if they are capable of something but they are we are human beings so they are not gods or angels and uh, to try for your limited experience uh, to give an help to these people for me this is fundamental what is your object for the future <laughs> this is a, a big uh, question. The only answer is all, <laughs> because I am interested in all the branches of uh, human culture and 
I, I never stop to study. Uh, the major part of people at the end of university has finished. No, I am still studying every day, each day, because every day, each day I discover new things, fantastic, that I want to, to study, to appreciate, and so uh, to, to live 1,000 years, but not for living uh, the stupid, but for having the time of uh, appreciating and studying all the new things that I discovered continuously. <laughs>